Mr. Moyo, welcome to Zoom Rights Live. Uh, thank you for inviting us. Uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's an honor to be uh, on your uh, platforms uh, that you are uh, lodging today. Um, and uh, we do not uh, think that uh, this could have been more timely uh, uh, given the situation that we are finding ourselves in as a country. Uh, we think this is quite a progressive step. Thank you very much. Can you uh, briefly introduce uh, to our Zim rights community your, yourself, your organization and the work that you do? Uh, thank you very much. Uh, I, I'm, I'm a Zim rights member uh, <laughs> to start with. Uh, I've been uh, since uh, time immemorial, um, and uh, I'm, 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 I'm happy to be part of this movement, um, which if you then want to reflect strongly, um, is one of the midwives in terms of the debates uh, and interventions around the issues of human rights violations in Zimbabwe. Um, and uh, to this age, it has stood the test of time uh, together with uh, the workers' uh, unions, uh, together with the students' unions, uh, women's groups, uh, in galvanizing uh, issues to do with uh, the need for the people of Zimbabwe to fully enjoy their rights that are given um, at birth and those that are strengthened through various instruments. Uh, where I am posted, uh, where I am delegated uh, by Zim rights is at Misa Zimbabwe. Uh, where I'm a team leader with uh, the Media Institute of Southern Africa. Um, I've been with the Media Institute of Southern Africa for the greater part of the decade from 2008, uh, where I joined uh, MISA as an advocacy officer, but also uh, became its uh, regional network brand manager and advocacy coordinator. Uh, I then uh, got uh, promoted or appointed um, to the position where I'm serving now in 2017. Um, the Media Institute of Southern Africa is a network uh, that is present in nine countries in Southern Africa, and Zimbabwe is one of them, um, which is uh, all about promoting freedom of expression, access to information, right to priv privacy, and uh, media freedom. Thank you, thank you very much. So today is the International Day for Universal Access to Information. Can you briefly share with us why information is so important for the realization of human rights? Uh, it, it is a, a, a unique day because uh, it took quite a, a, a big struggle uh, for, for this day to be recognized by the United Nations, uh, specifically through UNESCO. Uh, and uh, it's, it's uh, I think the Media Institute of Southern Africa was one of the organizations that uh, took regional uh, interventions together with uh, other colleagues from West Africa, East Africa, uh, Central Africa, uh, through creation of a platform that was to be termed APAI, uh, which was a platform for access to information uh, advocacy. Uh, this is a, a platform that took issues of uh, access to information at uh, different levels uh, to the SADC, uh, to AU, to UN, uh, to multiple platforms, uh, trying to ensure that this is recognized as one of the fundamental pillars for the enjoyment of human rights. Uh, in our own term and, terms and uh, phraseology, we, we then said this is the mother of all rights. Um, some, some rights, you can't enjoy them if you do not know them. Uh, you can't pretend to be enjoying them until you know of them. Uh, so we say promote this right uh, strongly uh, so that uh, a citizenry can at any given time make informed decisions uh, about the enjoyment of other rights such as health, uh, education, uh, among others. Uh, these are critical rights that are intertwined and they all congregate um, around access to information. The moment you know, then you start canvassing uh, for the enjoyment. The moment you know, you make correct decisions around how you are going to enjoy them. The moment you know, you make uh, those bold steps around how you involve yourself in the governance of your local structures. The moment you know, uh, you take those bold decisions around how you are going to actively participate in national processes. Uh, the moment you know, uh, you also then start enjoying other rights, like uh, the right to vote, the right to life, etc. Why? Because they all depend on the level of information that we have. And from where I'm coming from over these years, 
Uh, the central government has been the biggest holder of, right, of, of information um, until recently. Uh, you, you, you knew that they collected so much information, but they released so little. Uh, that's why we were saying uh, there's need to robustly come up with an act that promotes the release of that information uh, that will enable then uh, citizens to make informed decisions. Things have changed. Um, nowadays, even private uh, sector holds quite a huge uh, amounts of data. Um, uh, if you talk of mobile network operators, uh, they are literally as good as a, a mini government in terms of the level of information that they hold about a given people at any given time. Hence, what we are saying is, uh, if the people do not know that at any given time, uh, if they request information, it's supposed to come. There is also other information that they do not need to request. Uh, that both public entities and private entities should proactively release uh, without being uh, demanded uh, for them to do so. Why? Because there must be proactive steps that they are making, uh, especially if they know that uh, this information we inform decision making. They do not need to wait for people to doorstep them uh, and request for that information. So from where we are standing from, uh, this is a key right, firstly provided in the constitution uh, through section 62, uh, which says everyone has the right to access to information. Uh, secondly, uh, we have just uh, gone through the phases of um, coming up with the Freedom of Information Act, um, which came into effect in, July, in around July thereabout. Uh, which speaks to the need uh, for proactive disclosure of information for the public bodies to come up with uh, information officers. Uh, because uh, all these years you go to, for example, to Macombe building, you are moved from pillar to post. Uh, why? Because you do not know the entry point. But now the law says each entity uh, should create the office of information officer whereby a member of the public can walk in and request, can I see an information officer? And then all the information needs are catered for uh, from that uh, entry point. Uh, so to some of us, this is key. Uh, and uh, not only is it uh, key in Zimbabwe, but it's a, it's a, it's a continental issue uh, because uh, as you know, that uh, the whole continent is grappling around the issues of access to information. Way so in Sadak, it is the, some of the most uh, few countries with access to information laws, uh, such as uh, Zimbabwe uh, and South Africa. Um, if you then go to other countries, uh, even the most progressive ones like Namibia, they are still struggling. They had to enact an access to information law. Uh, same with Zambia. Only recently, with the new administration, are they saying they are going to operationalize an access to information law? Uh, talk of Angola, it actually criminalizes the release of information. Uh, talk of uh, Mozambique, West, um, and Tanzania, a democracy gone uh, uh, around access to information. So this is a critical day to us because uh, it defines our very same existence as a people. That it takes quite a lot of work, I think, to be able to achieve, and I think you have done very well. And together with uh, Zimrights, uh, I am aware that you were involved in the skirmishes between the government and Econet. What do you think is the role of business in protecting information rights, but as well as facilitating access to information? Um, thanks, thanks, uh, Zikama. Indeed, we, we partnered with the Zim Rights um, uh, in, uh, in uh, challenging um, the government not to infringe the right to privacy, uh, which is a, a, a key right um, that is equally intertwined uh, with the right to access to information. Uh, and the right to expression. Uh, what we had seen, uh, as you would also appreciate, was that uh, we were at a point, a turning point in terms of uh, creating a precedent. Uh, if we had just stood by and watched while the government uh, implemented a very wide um, uh, warrant by the police, which was going to lead to the seizure of Equinet's database, it was going to infringe on our right to privacy and by extension going to infringe on our right to express and by extension was going to minimize uh, future actions around uh, access to information. 
as you'd remember that uh, when we approached the court, we said uh, the, 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 the warrant was too wide and, and uh, the police uh, do not need to have such wide powers of search and seizure. Uh, which might then compromise um, uh, our 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 right to privacy. Remember, Econet is uh, is is a near monopoly in terms of our communication needs in Zimbabwe. Why? Because it commands close to eighty percent of the market share. Uh, that means that it it holds close to eighty percent of the users of our mobile um, and telecommunication services in Zimbabwe. Uh, but beyond that, remember they also uh, are a monopoly or literally a uh, an oligopoly in that uh, they they are the equivalent of mobile money. If you say uh, mobile money, it's, it's, it's equally as inter, you, equally interchangeable as uh, eco cash. So if 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 you then lump this together, it means that they are going to seize our very same DNA of operation because we are operating in a, a more or less a cashless society uh, which relies on mobile money. Uh, and electronic transactions. So by allowing the police to seize, it was going to create a very bad precedent. Uh, and so in this regard, it then led to a new understanding in terms of the ruling that uh, uh, we can no longer uh, have a situation whereby the government can willy-nilly, at willy-nilly levels, come in and come out uh, in terms of invading our right to privacy. What this means is that uh, there is need to rethink uh, the issues of uh, uh, access to information to include um, telecoms uh, because uh, it is the biggest holder of information uh, as they are offering numerous platforms uh, of, uh, of, 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 uh, of interaction, of business exchange, of interaction, which include but are not limited to mobile money, farming needs, um, health issues. You know that they also offer a, a, assurance services uh, and insurance services uh, they also offer uh, registry services they offer communication services so it is a broader spectrum that is converging around telecoms hence the mobile network operators have a new role which is bigger than the traditional role which was uh, planned when we we're coming up with laws our laws should become responsive to an extent that uh, they do not only limit um, disclosure of information held by the state, but also by public, private institution with a public function, uh, like what mobile network operators have become, like what telecoms companies have become, uh, so that uh, they regularly release information uh, that protects the citizens and that advances uh, our existential uh, causes as a people. Um, because come to think of it, for example, there are many questions around what will happen uh, for example, to the information that is held by mobile network operators upon death. This is information that must not be left to guessing, it must be circulated widely. What happens to the accounts that are held by telecoms operators, for example, if the account holder uh, is to uh, pass on, uh, who has the immediate rights uh, to access those, those accounts? How do you, do, you, do you dispose of information? That was held for too long, uh, among other things. During elections, we had situations which were quite sad of collusion of mobile network operators uh, colluding with political actors to the extent that from nowhere uh, you start having and un unsolicited for campaign messaging. So th th this creates a whole new chain of rethinking uh, issues of access to information uh, from the purely traditional one, uh, which was government-centric, uh, how government releases uh, stores and release, retrieves and shares information uh, to the new order of uh, access to information in the age of uh, a runaway technological development. Interesting, interesting. Yeah, so today ZimRights is launching um, ZimRights Live, the digital activism bouquet of a variety of tools. What role do you think digital activism plays um, in today's Zimbabwe? Well, I think uh, it is critical uh, to, to, to take the bold step uh, that uh, ZimRights has taken because uh, um, by its nature, activism has become universal. Uh, universal in that uh, it is no longer uh, defined as well in its traditional forms. Why? Because activism is taking different shapes, different formats, uh, and uh, the online space 
is a space that requires um, to be dominated by a progressive information uh, wherein we have seen over the years that uh, the levels of flooding of online spaces, specifically in Zimbabwe and con con uh, confines, uh, was mainly around the need for entertainment uh, and the utility value of uh, uh, the entertainment sector taking a lead role. Um, and it, it had a little, uh, or to, to the largest, an insignificant uh, role around conscious political activism, uh, around conscious uh, decision making in terms of information that nourishes um, our existence as a country. So this this approach by Zim rights of coming up with uh, deliberate moves in terms of how to contribute meaningfully to conversations online is a critical move. Why? Because uh, what happens online, contrary to what happens offline, offline has been more of an, a situation of uh, a unidirectional way of um, um, a, a ruling class sending uh, a, a certain elite class sending uh, one dimensional um, you know messaging to a target audience but what Zim rights has done is to take a conscious decision that uh, the, it needs to shape conversations online yeah, underlining the word conversations because the online community the online sphere is about conversations uh, it is a complex economy which is uh, mainly uh, dealing with the ability that you have as an institution to contribute meaningfully to conversations. Uh, when your conversations gain traction, uh, the currency can only be tracked through uh, how, how far is it being shared, uh, how far is it being uh, referred to, how far is it being uh, retweeted, uh, re-liked, uh, among other things. This, this is a complex economy which uh, many institutions uh, for many years um, do, did not want uh, to, to rock their boat because uh, it, it is, it is a, a daring platform. Um, and uh, within this platform, some of those platforms are quite candid, uh, they are robust, um, and uh, they require boldness, uh, the level of boldness that Zimrides has taken. What is key, therefore, is to saturate uh, information that is uh, curated um, professionally uh, that uh, in a way contribute to fighting uh, dis uh, and misinformation uh, and ensuring that uh, factual uh, presentation of information is pivotal uh, and that uh, the people of Zimbabwe becomes become even more wiser and, and, and more informed uh, out of engaging uh, on the Zim rights platforms uh, in terms of uh, the activism the activism in Zimbabwe. Why? Because uh, when traditionally there was a role of gatekeeping, which was so strong, uh, given that uh, the media structures in Zimbabwe, uh, uh, in terms of popular uh, media such as radio, are by and large owned and controlled by the ruling elite. Uh, we need platforms of this nature that allows for diversity of views and allows for conversations uh, that are uncomfortable uh, and that contribute Im immensely uh, to the checks and balances to the ruling elite, uh, to those uh, that are within the struggles for expression, for human rights. Um, they need uh, that same support structure where they articulate alternative views and propagate alternative policy positions. Uh, and this can only happen when you deliberately invest uh, in the new means of communication because our needs as a people, uh, our way of interacting as a people is changing, is evolving. And what Zim rights have done is to show that it is evolving with the changing uh, tastes uh, of the audiences, uh, of the stakeholders, uh, that it wants to be where the stakeholders are and contribute meaningfully uh, to the conversations that they are making, especially uh, through the online spaces. And above all, it should not be a content generation issue alone. Uh, Zim rights has to take a 360 degree approach of also supporting uh, the broader cause uh, around making uh, internet a universally accessible uh, platform. Uh, that is to say by using the platforms equally uh, promote uh, the structural discussions around the need for accessibility of platforms, uh, the need for affordability uh, of the internet pl platforms, uh, the need for continuous availability 
uh, of the platforms. What we have since come to term as the three A's, uh, because Zimbabwe has been uh, notorious uh, of either throttling uh, or shutting down the internet. Um, when, when it is outside the shutting down or throttling season, uh, it is highly in inaccessible uh, due to the cost structures. Hence the need for Zimrise to take that deliberate effort of uh, contribute towards content, but also uh, contribute towards the policy formulation uh, discussion. That is quite deep. Now, talking about internet uh, freedom, um, in making use of uh, digital tools for activism, what, I mean, from your perspective as an expert in this area, what should activists watch out for to ensure their safety, but also to increase their impact? Indeed, indeed, these, these are treacherous spaces. Um, there is always, Zimbabwe has shown over these years that there's always a false sense of uh, security uh, when people are communicating uh, using uh, digital platforms. Yet it is the most dangerous uh, way of communicating because it leaves, it leaves a permanent record uh, online. Um, and in elsewhere, the, 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 the various constituencies have started speaking around debate around the right to be forgotten. Why? Because the internet does not forget. Um, whatever you post, even if you presume that you have deleted it, it's stored somewhere. Uh, it is upon the platforms uh, to delete it or not to delete it. Hence, broadly speaking, activists in Zimbabwe are highly vulnerable because they, they, they themselves uh, engage in risky behavior. Uh, with all the amount of training that has gone into the need uh, for and awareness around the need for safe use of the internet, you still find a lot of activists, uh, for example, um, uh, communicating uh, through uh, non-encrypted platforms, um, communicating uh, activism work, which at times is very dangerous, uh, through open calls uh, such as voice and text um, and that uh, they do so without even uh, running basic software that allows for them to communicate in a safe uh, manner online. Uh, that is to say they do rarely uh, utilize um, VPNs uh, and other support mechanisms that allow for uh, safe usage of uh, online spaces. This is quite dangerous in that um, the levels of uh, scrutiny online is high. Uh, you have heard numerous pronouncements um, by the by the commander uh, in chief of defense forces, uh, by the commander of defense forces, commander in chief of defense forces, um, security ministries, um, various spokespersons of government, to the effect that they've got a strong appetite. Uh, in terms of monitoring uh, use of internet and uh, levels of activism online for the sole purposes of reprisals. Uh, and it is from this angle that uh, users of platforms uh, should put security first. Whatever they are communicating, their first line of defense is to use secure platforms to ensure that their communications uh, do not in any way uh, lead to their right to privacy being compromised. Uh, and that, uh, in terms of secure use of platforms, when you communicate in a secure manner, you also protect uh, the chain of users of the same platform uh, or those who are going to access your information uh, when you have communicated. Uh, that is to say, the recipients of your information when you are communicated for a collective. Um, and a strong ecosystem uh, in terms of human rights activists uh, to think security first, to use secure platforms, end-to-end uh, -end encrypted platforms, um, uh, such as WhatsApp, such as Signal, when they are communicating. When you are communicating online, always making sure that uh, you do not in any way endanger uh, your stakeholder chains. That way, uh, you then minimize the risk that befalls both yourself uh, and those that you are targeting when you are communicating. Um, simply put, uh, uh, there are comrades within this um, era of existence whom if you grab their phone, it doesn't have the minimum security issues 
to take care of their data in their mobile phone. Uh, there are no passwords. Uh, uh, when when passwords are put, they are more put in in, in, in fear of their uh, partners than in fear of the real danger, uh, which is <laughs> organized danger. So this is the way we are coming from and where we are saying there is need for deliberate uh, security uh, mindset, which, which, which thinks security first uh, before even starting to generate content uh, and security always uh, to the tail end of the communication chain online. Thank you very much. That is very helpful. We want people to receive and share information and we want them to do it without causing harm to themselves or any of their stakeholders. I think as we come to the close of this conversation and in commemoration of this very important day, um, I would want to invite you to share any of your last parting words to the Zim rights community. Well, uh, I think uh, Zim rights uh, uh, occupies a very strategic seat in terms of uh, advocating for a broader human rights base uh, in that it has a, a critical muscle uh, of uh, structures that enables a wider enjoyment of the right to access to information uh, if it is gearing itself towards the way it is pointed. Uh, that is of opening up um, uh, platforms that allows for access to information. Uh, and that deliberately Zoom rights as part of its strategy need to absorb the need to promote the growth um, of uh, platforms uh, beyond its own, uh, broadly uh, speaking, at media level, media supply chain of the information. Uh, secondly, at policy level, uh, whereby they become one of the key uh, voices uh, that are allowed ar around the need uh, for Zimbabwe to proactively disclose information it has. Uh, one of the key challenges that uh, continue to uh, be an albatross on Zimbabwe's neck is uh, the declassification challenge. Uh, information uh, and decisions being made by the government. Some of us shall go to our graves uh, without knowing what was uh, discussed, what decisions were made by and on behalf of the citizens uh, by a central government. Uh, hence, a deliberate approach uh, towards checks and balances now on the government uh, through uh, ensuring that uh, constitutional provisions around Section 62 uh, are dead to not only Section 62, but 61 and 57, which speaks to expression and right to privacy, are at the center of Zim rights programming and awareness chain. And uh, that Zim rights has already taken a proactive nature in terms of collaborating around broadening uh, this scope, around broadening the need to uh, for enjoyment of uh, access to information and right to privacy as seen uh, with our recent case, uh, which was uh, won at the, at the High Courts. So uh, it is uh, my congratulatory message to Zim Rights for taking a bold decision uh, to broaden the scope in terms of the supply side of information, um, in terms of uh, galvanizing its base uh, so that it has meaningful access to information that enables uh, for the uh, making of correct decisions. Uh, why we insist on uh, making uh, informed decisions? because uh, ignorant decisions are very expensive to correct uh, and at times might lead to loss of lives. Uh, hence the need to always have correct information at our fingertips so that it advances our correct decision making. And in this regard, Zim Rights has taken quite a broad, a bold, a progressive decision. And I want to congratulate you uh, on launching a, a, a mixture of platforms uh, that is going to advance this right to, to firstly to express, secondly, uh, to, for the people of Zimbabwe to have access to authentic information in the sea of quite disinforming information that we are finding online. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for those warming messages and uh, thank you for your continued support to Zim Rights. Please enjoy the rest of the day. Thank you for inviting us.